From Kansas State University, this is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Brian Coffey will talk about his new study of hedging feedlot cattle in the futures market as a way to manage price risk. He compared the economic returns to hedged and non-hedged cattle over the last 10 years to gauge the effectiveness of hedging in mitigating that risk. Then, from the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State, Bob Larson, Brad White, and Bob Weber will go over things to think about when considering culling bulls from the breeding herd. And on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd advises you homeowners and gardeners about controlling several landscape and garden insect pests right now. All that and more right here on Agriculture Today. A social distancing tip. Putting distance between yourself and others is critical to slowing the spread of coronavirus. So here are ways to stay in contact without the physical contact part. Call, send a text, set up a video conference, post on social media, dedicate a song on the radio. If you have symptoms of fever, dry cough, and shortness of breath, call your health care provider before going to their office. For more info, visit coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Thanks for tuning in for another Agriculture Today. Good to have you aboard. Well, the ability to manage economic risk is everything to the cattle feeder. It's it's a highly important facet of overall management. And our guest on this first segment of the broadcast has just completed a rather exhaustive study of how cattle hedging works for that risk management purpose. Joining us now, agricultural economist Brian Coffey of Kansas State University. He has posted his full paper on this very subject on the agmanager.info website. First of all, what inspired you to want to look at this, Brian? Well, I think that as academics, we're often encouraging uh, producers out there to hedge their output. And I think Sometimes there's uh, mixed signals, and some people are more receptive or less receptive to that message. And so I think putting a specific study like this out there about live cattle could be helpful for producers who are considering using futures markets to hedge their uh, sale of live cattle. And so basically just wanted to, to the degree that I could, put some hard numbers and statistics around Uh, this idea of hedging the sale of live cattle. And you did so by looking at data over a 10-year time span, which we'll get into. But let's step back and explain, for those who aren't familiar with the approach, how cattle hedging actually works. Yeah, that's a great question. And I would just point out that Ag Manager has some uh, good information about that for people that want to dig in a little bit and learn more. So I would encourage you to do that. The basic idea is you've got actual physical cattle in the cash market. You're growing and you want to turn into live cattle at some point. When you start feeding cattle, you don't know what the live cattle price is going to be by the time those cattle are ready to harvest. And so there's some uncertainty and risk around that price. Well, one way to manage that is to then go into the futures market and use a corresponding futures contract. And so in this case, that would be the CME live cattle futures contract. And so basically what you do is you take a position, we say, that is equal and opposite your position in the cash market. And so in the physical cash market, you will be selling live cattle um, sometime in the future. And so in the futures market, you want to do the equivalent of selling right now, all right? And so what that means is you enter into a contract and you promise to provide or deliver live cattle at a certain time in the future, and it's a binding contract. And you do that for the number of contracts that would approximately cover the number of live cattle that you have on feed. As time goes on, what happens is your position in physical cattle uh, will change depending on live cattle price, and so will your position in the futures market, and they change in opposite ways because your position is equal and opposite. So if your live physical cattle are decreasing in value, 
your futures position, investment is increasing in value and it offsets that loss. And so as you get down to the to the end and it's time to sell those cattle for harvest, you liquidate your futures position and you take your gains or your losses from that and basically put that with the revenue from selling the physical cattle. Mm-hmm. What that does is it lets you be able to to better predict what you will sell live cattle for in the future. You miss extreme gains, but you miss extreme losses also. And so those are the mechanics of hedging, and that leads us to your research. You wanted to quantify just how well that risk has been managed, and you relied on 10 years' worth of actual price data here. Yeah, that's right. So so I went in and, and looked at price data from uh, the USDA Ag Marketing Service. So we have that at the level, a state level for Kansas. So I took those prices of steers and heifers uh, that have been sold over the past 10 years on a weekly basis and got kind of an average live cattle price for Kansas and then looked at the live cattle futures prices also. What I wanted to do was to be able to compare hedged sales with unhedged sales. And so what we needed to do to do that was come up with a hedged price series. And so basically what I assumed is that a producer would go in, hedge cattle immediately upon placement. So feeder cattle placed, you put the hedge on, and then you immediately lift the hedge when those live cattle are priced or sold. And so it's a very disciplined, systematic hedging routine. Uh, And I use 23 weeks, which is about 160 days for the feeding period. And so then we just went, I just went in and calculated what would be the price had you hedged. And the way I got that was just to take the cash price and then add the gains or the losses that would have occurred from a futures market position. And so then we get a hedged price series on a weekly basis that we can compare to the cash or the unhedged price series. Now, there is, not surprisingly, quite some depth to this analysis, and we can't dig too far into it. But to give some general conclusions as you compare the hedged versus unhedged positions in marketing cattle out of the feed yards. Did you find that one or the other has an advantage in as far as a producer gaining returns from those cattle? Yeah, well, I think one thing that came out of it would be surprising to a lot of people uh, to answer your question, and that is if we just look at average price received. Mm -hmm. So that's just the average price level that you know, live cattle would have been sold for from 2010 up to the present. Um, The hedged prices are lower, but they're very slightly lower. They're only 48 cents per hundred weight lower than unhedged sales on average. And I think a lot of times people sort of have in mind that to get the risk management benefit of hedging, you take a pretty big hit on expected or average returns And, you know, over the long term, we're just not seeing that. Now, uh, in given weeks or given months, you definitely give up some of those extreme, you know, positive times when when cash prices rally unexpectedly. You do give up the opportunity to benefit from that. But you also avoid extreme weeks when prices uh, decline unexpectedly. That is rather interesting that there's a consistency that uh, the strategies can run so evenly over time. One other feature in this study, actually two case studies of extreme price declines in the cattle market and how hedging functioned within those, and they are of recent vintage. So we're very well acquainted with them, one having to do with the packing plant fire at Holcomb, Kansas last year, the other, not surprisingly, having to do with the pandemic and its impact on the packing sector uh, here this past spring. Talk about what you found out as far as hedging's performance under those two scenarios. Yeah, it is unfortunate that we have two uh, sort of extreme case studies in such a short time period. 
But I think it's important to look at that. And so if we go back to the fall of 2019, I just went in and picked out the period from July to October. Uh, the Holcomb fire was around, I think, August 9th. And so I wanted to pick a time period of a few weeks before to a few weeks after to kind of give it a, you know, a fair shake. And uh, what I what I saw was uh, the hedged price on average for July to October was about ten dollars per hundred weight higher. So if someone's marketing fed cattle week after week through that time period, having them hedged was worth ten dollars per hundred weight higher. We can put that in a value of gain framework, which I think is valuable. And so for that, again, I was using a 23-week feeding period, three and a quarter pounds per day of average daily gain. What I came up with there was that the average weekly value of gain for the hedge cattle was about $123 per head higher than the unhedged. And then just to mention, you know, the spring of this year, and for that, for the COVID-19 pandemic, I looked at February to the end of June. And over that time period, the hedge value of gain has averaged about $221 per head higher than unhedged. So I think a big take-home lesson for both of those is that hedging can protect against uh, scenarios like this that can frankly end a business that could end the life of a, of a feeding operation and hedging can protect against these catastrophic losses. Great work here because it does take a little bit of leg work to pull all of this data together and run such an analysis over a 10 year time horizon. Brian, thanks for sharing the highlights of it today and appreciate your time. Thanks, Eric. Brian Coffey, agricultural economist at K-State, and once again, the paper is entitled Hedging Kansas Live Cattle, a summary of outcomes over the past 10 years. Find it now at agmanager.info, and we'll be back after this. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Man, it's hot out here. Heat stress affects more than just humans. It also affects livestock. Extreme heat, humidity, wind speeds, and cloud cover all make a difference in air temperature. To control problems, make sure your livestock have shade and water provided at all times. This will help prevent problems in breeding, meat production, and reduce chances of death. Please take all these into consideration for livestock production. Brought to you by K-State Animal Science Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today, and now some input for you cow-calf operators. Here on the broadcast of late, you've heard some thoughts about making cow culling decisions in the latter part of summer or in the fall. Cows that turn up open are often prime candidates for moving along. But what about the other side of the scale? What circumstances would turn a producer in the direction of culling bulls from the herd? Well, that very topic made for lighthearted debate on the latest Cattle Chat podcast produced by the Beef Cattle Institute at K-State. And joining in on that fray, veterinarian Bob Larson, cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, and the director of the Institute, veterinarian Brad White. Today, we're going to talk some about culling bulls. So the bulls may have come out of the breeding pasture. We're thinking about culling them, thinking about doing some things, and really... We got into this because we talked about it before the show, and it's Bob versus Bob. As we're thinking about culling decisions, when we look at those bulls, and and I'm going to throw out a topic, which is a a baited question, which is more important, fertility or genetics? Uh, So that's easy. I'm the veterinarian. It's it's (laughs) it's fertility. Fertility is way more important than genetics. I want a bull that goes out and breeds a bunch of cows. Well, Um, I think genetics are still important, and you know, one could argue that there might be actually a genetic effect on the uh, you know, libido or uh, willingness of bulls to go settle cows. So there, there might be actually a, a genetic solution to this. So He's saying genetics so, supersedes your fertility yeah, because it's included. <laughs> he, says it's every, he says genetics is everything. And, yeah. Uh, but, but I, yeah, yeah. But I'm going to go point always, to Weber. Point to Weber on that one because he, he got yeah, there. I don't know, but <laughs> but these genetics things. So he's talking about these things that are in the DNA, and stuff. I can't see that. It 
and it doesn't express itself in these young bulls when I purchase them until they're old and I'm ready to cull them. But one of the point, and Dr. Weber and I were talking about a paper that I read recently. So in multi-bull pastures, if you weighed the total weight of the calves from each bull as they're sold. So if bull A has uh, 28 calves and they average 450 pounds, and bull B has 12 calves and they average 580 pounds, genetically, a lot of people would say, well, bull B is better. His calves average higher weaning weights. I would say bull A is better. He sold more pounds of weaning weight. And that has to do with fertility or breeding aggressiveness or something. And, and in reality, I'm being a little bit pushy here because I want to push my point. And, and obviously, I'm not saying genetics isn't important. But you could see where that ability and desire of the bull to go out and mate. And, and I get paid for the calves that he weans. And, and so I'm, I'm just saying that don't forget the fertility side. So, it, so when you say your best bull, oh, uh, man, when I say best, I'm not, I'm not thinking genetics. I'm thinking breeding. Yeah, and Thank you. So, so this is a different scenario, too, because in February, March, we talked about what to look for when buying a bull. And those were a certain set of criteria. Now, when we're culling a bull, it's a little bit different question, right? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, you look at, you know, obviously breeding performance is a, is a, is a key indicator and, and actually the way that we uh, recoup uh, our investment in, in genetics. And so there's a number of studies. In fact, we looked at, um, in, in my dissertation research, a pilot study where we genotyped calves back to established paternity. And there were some bulls that produced one or two calves. Um, and these would be yearling bulls turned out with yearling bulls. So it wasn't a, a real age stratification issue. It was you know, down to the bull performance. And one of the things we hypothesized was, um, well, one, could we um, maybe reorder the, the social groupings to get good bulls in a position where they were competing against a less dominant bull um, as a potential strategy to manage that. And of course, we didn't have enough time to actually conduct that experiment. The other one was starting to look at, you know, is there an underlying, again, the sort of genetic component about you know, bulls' aggressiveness in, in, in breeding pastures, and is that a heritable trait or not? Is it more of a physical, I tussled it out and I won, so I get all the cows um, sort of scenario. So um, I think it points to the, you know, the things that we can manage in this scenario, most of us aren't going to go out and sort of sort bulls off and, and cull them because they didn't breed cows because we don't have that information. We don't know that. Yeah. We don't know that. And so having uh, consistency in purchasing decisions, so you know, buying the same kinds of bulls, because ultimately what you get in a, in a breeding operation is sort of a weighted average of the genetic merit of the bulls that you turn out with cows. Um, and so doing a good job using the available tools in terms of, you know, making sure the bulls EPDs have genomics included, that we've selected them against a, a fairly consistent set of criteria. So they're similar in terms of their genetic makeup for a particular battery of bulls. It makes a fair bit of sense. Well, and I'll, I'll throw a, a bone over to Dr. Weber and agree with him on something in that, you know, some of the newer EPD tools and newer is just for an old guy like me that look like heifer stability and heifer breed up and which indicate some some of the fertility aspects, which weren't in the early EPDs, which were more just growth. And again, I'm going to just come back to how important fertility is to the final pounds that we sell. And so to really look at those when you're selecting the bull and monitor that really closely with our breeding soundness exams and putting heavy selection pressure on bulls that are most likely to have some success on the fertility side. So if you guys were going to pick your criteria for culling a bull, so we talked about fertility mm -hmm. is really important. He's got to be able to pass the breeding soundness exam. Yep. He has to fit my genetic goals, right? So both his actual genetics and, and my current breeding program. What else do you think about as you're culling bulls? Well, you already said it, but to pass the breeding soundness exam, and that's not just the semen evaluation. That's the physical. So feet, legs, penis, scrotum, all of that. Is, is absolutely critical. The other thing that I, I think is pretty important is, is his temperament. And, you know, I, I hate to sell a bull that I paid good money for that I like in other ways just because I can't get along with him. But at the same time, uh, bulls can be dangerous. Uh, they can tear up a lot of things. And so I, I would say, and I kind of throw that in with my reading soundness exams, just an evaluation of the bull's 
physical and behavioral attributes. So yeah, I, I agree. I think the, the, the temperament, particularly as we think about uh, smaller herds where there's, you know, families involved in, in the day-to-day -day management uh, or lots of, you know, I'm thinking uh, intense production versus extensive production. You know, if, if you're out horseback checking cows, um, you kind of have the ability to get away from a bad bull. If you're in a five-acre trap with a group of cows and a bull and he decides to get after you, it's it's potentially a, a really really dangerous really situation. Dangerous. Yep. And so um, bull temperament, I think, is, is one that really important. And particularly as people age, you know, our mobility goes down, um, our willingness You're, to wear athletic you looking at footwear. Me? Uh, are you looking at me? Looking yeah. at me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, willingness to, to utilize our athletic footwear goes down. And so uh, that, that can be a really, really critical piece. Um, the other piece is cost, obviously. You know, if we, we spend um, three or four or five thousand dollars for a yearling bull, and he only we only get one breeding season out of him. Uh, economic impact to our operation uh, in terms of amortized cost per breeding for the next bull that comes behind him goes dramatically up, like maybe a hundred hundred fifty bucks per per calf conceived. And so we have to be be cognizant of the the investment we have, and, and how do we manage that too? Uh, yeah, it's a di different set of math on your. I'm going to call this bull versus when I'm going to purchase them and I'm comparing two bulls. So you, you, you have to be sure, and I think you're right, you're exactly right, looking at what the impact of that culling has on bull depreciation, because that's really what we're talking about. Well, and then one thing that I've seen occasionally is, you know, you buy a bull and you really wanted him to be a calving east bull or you really wanted to keep heifers out of him, and then, then I really don't like his heifers or uh, he's not as calving east as I thought. Uh, based on when I purchased him. So either I've got to move him into a different set of cows where that's not a problem, or I've got to trade him out and get something else. And, and you know, again, you hate to do that because I've already got the money invested in him. Uh, but if he's not doing what I wanted him to do, uh, that's something to consider. Yeah, absolutely. And that, and that leads us, this discussion leads us to our cattle chat checklist for this week, which are our top five considerations when culling bulls. Number five, uh, he doesn't fit the current breeding goals. So if you've got a, a cross-breeding system or have made a change to your breeding program and this particular bull doesn't fit that, uh, it's a good reason to move him down the road. Number four, his actual genetics don't align with your expectations. He doesn't do what I wanted him to do. Number three, we've retained too many daughters in the herd, so we want to control inbreeding and limit sire daughter mating uh, events. And so if we've already retained a bunch of females in the herd, we might need a different bull. Number two, he has an undesirable temperament. And number one, he can't pass the breeding soundness exam. And those are our top five considerations when culling bulls. That from the latest Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute at Kansas State University. Bob Weber, Bob Larson, and Brad White there. That same podcast, by the way, also delved into the impact of heat stress on herd breeding activity. You can take it all in at bciksu.org, bciksu.org. We'll be back in a bit. This is the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. For 25 years, K-State Research and Extension's Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services has been providing a no-cost, confidential place to call in and visit with an agricultural lawyer. Our experts are available to help you producers handle legal and financial issues. Explore your options and generate solutions. Call us at 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. You're tuned in to the K-State Radio Network and Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here and continuing on with today's agricultural news headlines for you, courtesy in part of DTN. Senate Agriculture Appropriations Subcommittee Chairman John Hoven of North Dakota said yesterday that he expects Congress to write another coronavirus aid package that includes agriculture in the coming weeks. 
Now, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell said this week he expects that the Republicans in the Senate and President Trump will come up with a coronavirus aid package next week. The House has already passed its package, as you know, called the HEROES Act. But House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said this week she's willing to cancel or postpone the House recess scheduled to begin at the end of July to reach an agreement with the Senate on a final bill. Hoven said he expects the next aid package would continue the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program, or CFAP, with some add-ons. But he added that the House package cost $3 trillion and that the final package, in his opinion, will not be that large. The ethanol industry has seen over $3.4 billion in lost revenues due to the pandemic. That's according to the Renewable Fuels Association in an announcement yesterday. Pandemic-related damages in the ethanol sector could reach some $9 billion, $7 billion in losses during 2020 and another $1.8 billion in 2021, according to the RFA. They went on to say in that release, if additional travel and business restrictions are adopted by states, the losses would be larger and may even surpass the $10 billion estimate from the RFA's initial analysis released back in April. The $3.4 billion decline in revenues seen to date were due to a combination of reduced ethanol output and lower prices, according to the RFA. And they went on to say the social distancing and the government restrictions associated with COVID-19 resulted in a dramatic reduction in the consumption of motor gasoline and ethanol in the spring of 2020. Omaha-based Green Plains has alleged now that Archer Daniels Midland conducted a scheme to illegally depress the ethanol cash spot market beginning in November of 2017. That in a class action lawsuit filed on Monday in the U.S. District Court for the District of Nebraska in Lincoln, ADM already faces a similar lawsuit in the U.S. District Court for the Central District of Illinois, where AOT Holding alleges that ADM manipulated the market at the Argo, Illinois terminal by flooding the fuel terminal with lower-priced ethanol starting in November of 17 through March of 2019. The Argo Terminal, the daily location for ethanol trading, the 30-minute trading window at the terminal is considered crucial because it's used to set the daily Chicago benchmark price to determine the value of Chicago ethanol derivatives. That benchmark price is used then to price and settle ethanol derivatives on the New York Mercantile Exchange and the Chicago Board of Trade. Now, Green Plains alleges in its lawsuit that ADM has continued to manipulate the market to the present day. Green Plains has asked the court for a jury trial to order ADM to pay all financial damages and legal fees to a class of plaintiffs and to enjoin ADM from continuing that conduct. A USDA proposal now under comment would make official the use of certain forms of radio frequency ID tags in moving cattle across state lines. Here's more from the USDA's Rod Bain. Public comment is being accepted through October 5th on a USDA proposal to make certain approved radio frequency ID tags as official identification for interstate movement of cattle. This is Undersecretary for Marketing and Regulatory Programs, Greg Ibaugh. With this announcement, we have worked with the beef industry to figure out how we can start phasing out some of the manual systems that require auction barns and veterinarians to read tag, write down long numbers in those that are visible on those tags, and then be able to share them on health certificates or official documents as animals move across the United States. Undersecretary Ibaugh says this this is part of efforts to increase animal disease traceability. The new proposal would also apply to bison as well, as bison and bovine share vulnerability to several diseases. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Coming your way next, this week's edition of the Kansas Soybean Update. Here's Greg Akagi. Charles Atkinson, a farmer from Great Bend and serves as the Kansas representative on the American Soybean Association Board of Directors, joins us. And Charles ASA has upcoming deadlines to apply for the Corteva Young Leader Program and the Conservation Legacy Awards. 
That is correct. And we do have a couple really good uh, opportunities for our leaders out there. And I don't take that lightly. We do have leaders that are out there in the agricultural industry that are, number one, conservation-wise. We have a lot of great people out there doing conservation in the state of Kansas. And we have the Conservation Legacy Award that is uh, taking applications right now through September 1st. And this award is uh, recognizing farm management practices for our soybean farmers who are both environmentally friendly and profitable. And I know we got a lot of guys out there that have done a lot of great conservation work over the years, and we want to encourage them to apply and represent the state of Kansas on this national competition. It's a great opportunity to show what you've got, what you're doing, and how it can be done here in the state of Kansas. What's the deadline to apply for the Conservation Legacy Awards? We've got September 1st that's coming up through the application on that. You can go to the American Soybean Association website, soygrowers.com and uh, get that application and go through it. It's pretty simple to fill out, and uh, we really look forward to seeing some good applications from the state. What also has been a very dynamic program is the Young Leader Program as well. Yes, the Young Leader Program, something that started in uh, 1984. And that program, even though it says young leaders, we're not looking at young leaders as an age. We're looking at young leaders as in heart. We have some people that's gone through there that's been in their 40s and 50s before that just has decided that they want to get involved in a, a leadership role in agriculture. This program started in 84, and Corteva AgriScience is now the sponsor of the uh, Young Leader Program. And this is an opportunity to visit with and work with uh, leaders from all over the country. They have uh, two phases. One's in December in Johnson, Iowa, and the second phase is in San Antonio at the Comande Classic. And uh, you can go on uh, soygrowers.com also on that and look for the Young Leader Program and sign up there. And we'd be excited to uh, get some applicants from Kansas on that that has an interest not only to learn more about the soybean industry, but also the marketing of soybeans and also being able to be an advocate for soybeans up in Washington, D.C. That is Charles Atkinson from Great Bend, who serves as a Kansas representative on the American Soybean Association Board of Directors, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Greg Akagi there. Thanks, Greg. And You're listening to Agriculture Today. Social distancing slows the spread of coronavirus, so stay a minimum of six feet away from others and stay home if you can. More info at coronavirus.gov. Let's all do our part, because we're all hashtag alone together. Brought to you by the Ad Council. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today and to round out this Thursday edition, our weekly horticulture segment, as we catch up once more with Raymond Cloyd, Horticultural Entomologist, K-State Research and Extension, and the insect world has been bustling out there in lawn and garden. We'll cover as much of it as possible today, Raymond. Let's put the capper on bagworm control, though, (laughs) if we might. So we are surely past the point of direct treatment of those bagworms. I would say, Eric, about two more weeks if we get warm temperatures. I'm still seeing small bagworms out there. People can still use uh, a product containing spinosad, which we've mentioned n- numerous times in the show. And later on, then you can go to a pyrethroid. But uh, you get a spray now, continue to do it for several weeks. But they are still out there, and it's still, it is still time to treat. And you can still treat before it'll become basically they will go into stages where they will not be affected by any insecticides. So, yeah, I would say two to three more weeks of treatments, and then we'll just see what happens after that, Eric. But don't delay is your point here because yeah. it will get past the point of no return relatively soon. It's, uh, I would say uh, from here till about the end of July, weekly applications uh, for bagworm uh, management. Very well. Well, tell us about Japanese beetles and their heightened activity. What are you seeing out there? Well, uh, I want to explain Japanese beetles are an invasive species. Uh, We have them in Kansas. The grub larval stage is in the ground, and it's a turf grass pest. But right now the adults are out, and the adults are out for about three to four months, and they feed on a lot of different plant types, anything in the rose family, cherry, plum, that they feed on linden and grape and things like that. And we're seeing a lot of activity on grapes and other plant material now, Eric. And so it's unfortunate the only way to deal with the adults is spraying with an insecticide. And most of the insecticides that we recommend are what we call hard materials. That is, they'll kill beneficials, pollinators, but 
if you're going to try to save your plants from foliar damage by Japanese beetle adults, that's what you have to do. Yeah. Now, these are very visible bugs, are they not? Yeah, the Japanese beetle adult looks very different from a green June beetle. Uh, they're about a quarter of an inch. They have these white tufts of hairs on the periphery of the abdomen. There's about 14, and the only insect that we experience that has that. So uh, metallic green, coppery wing colors. But look for those white tufts of hair around the periphery of the of the abdomen. Jump on those as quickly as possible. They will riddle roses and other ornamentals fairly handily if you don't control them with some swiftness there. Squash vine bores. Not sure we've talked about this one very often in the past. Well, the squash vine borer is prevalent this year. Uh, I just helped a neighbor dig two of them out of his uh, pumpkin. But uh, the squash vine borer adult is an orange clear wing moth uh, with about four to five spots on the abdomen. And uh, the female lays eggs at the base of the squash plant. Uh, they feed on pumpkin squash, zucchini, and the eggs hatch in these larvae after emerging from the eggs, tunnel into the base of the plant and they get in the plant and start feeding. And once they're inside the plant, Eric, you'll notice your cucumbers and zucchini and pumpkins, even if your water will start to collapse and there's nothing you can do other than remove those plants that are wilting, dispose of them as soon as possible so you don't have that plant serving as a reservoir for affecting the other squash, zucchini, or cucumber plants. But the larvae get inside the plant tissue Therefore, they escape exposure from insecticides, and right now they're out. Uh, I have uh, in the ne- our next extension entomology newsletter, I will have an article on squash vine borer with some images. And so they are out. The larvae are in squash, zucchini, pumpkin, and they can cause substantial damage. In fact, they can actually kill the plant. I mean, it'll just collapse, and the plant will not recover. So nothing culturally that can be done against these borers. As you say, the insecticides are not effective because you just can't reach them. But anything else that can be done, Raymond? Well, if you have a lot of time in your hands, and this, uh, the COVID might help you, is if you can uh, cut a slit with a, a razor blade or knife and tease it apart, you can, if, if you remove the larva with tweezers and then kill them, you will cover that area with soil and some straw mulch. And the plant might recover. I actually told my neighbor to do that this weekend. And we found two larvae in his pumpkin. And we opened it up and we pulled them out. We squished them. And then he covered the uh, base of it with soil and mulch. And that may help the plant to survive. But if you've got more than that or you can't get the larvae, then they're just going to feed and move up the stem and slowly and surely kill the plant, Eric. So once again, to know what's going on, what would you look for in as far as the appearance of the plant that would tip you off about this borer? Well, one of the things, if you go out to the gardens, what I do is if I'll see if there's uh, six zucchinis and one of them is wilting very badly, uh, I would check the base of that one and look for some green frass or goo because that's where the larva tunneled in. And then that's an indication that that plant likely has squash vine borer larva feeding. So the plant doesn't respond to water. It stays, it continues to wilt, and eventually will die. Be aware of squash vine borers then. Their name may be not so imposing, but the damage can be when they get into your vine crops. And we do have an extension publication on squash vine borer, Eric. Yeah. Very well. And talk with us about spider mites. We're into the throws of the summer heat, and that's usually the signal that we will see spider mite activity ramp up. With the very hot temperatures uh, that we've seen, uh, we are seeing what we call the two-spotted spider mite. It's a warm season mite, likes it hot and dry, and we're already seeing damage on tomatoes and yonimus and the common host that it feeds upon. Uh, if you do see, like, white, yellow stippling on your leaves or you see the spider mites, just take a force of water spray and dislodge them. Just blast them off, and that should dislodge them. There are some insecticides or miticides. You can also use horticultural oils. They're also effective. But I usually recommend using a force of water spray to dislodge them. Now, they're going to be on the leaf underside, so you have to get the leaf undersides. If you just hit the tops, that won't do you any good. And one needs to stay after spider mites, uh, more than once, do they not? Will they yeah, return? I would say you'd have to do force of water sprays for about a week, for about four to five weeks. 
especially if we continue to get hot, dry uh, temperatures that we normally will get August and September. Yeah. Raymond, we always appreciate the input. Many thanks to you. You're very welcome, Eric. Look forward to our next visit. Horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd of K-State Research and Extension with us on this week's horticulture segment. And that caps off our Thursday edition. As always, thanks to you for being along with us. And please rejoin us right here tomorrow. Until then, Eric Atkinson for Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network. <music>